God. Different kinds of working, but the same God works in all. New to each, now to each is the manifestation of the Spirit given for the common good. So the body is one unit, though made up of many parts. And if one part hurts, the whole body hurts. If one part is honored, the whole body is honored. And the reason I show that is because when I was in New Zealand, um, it seemed to me that the biggest uh, positive for healing was that sense of unity, that everybody is one. And I had some pictures. Um, Janet, maybe there's a folder on the floor that has some photos in it I was going to bring. Uh, they're all the same, but and they're just run off from my home uh, network, so they're not very good. But uh, this is just a little example. That was outside a playground in Dunedin. And it's in Maori and in English because they try very hard to have everything in Maori as well as in English. Um, <clears throat> and it says, they are us. I mean, very simple. The flower shops were sold out of flowers, which was incredible. Um, the Prime Minister, you probably saw, said immediately, whether you are native-born Kiwi or a refugee or an immigrant, you are us. And that was totally firm. Um, she did not say the name of the tutor because she didn't want to give him any more notoriety, which I thought was a very excellent thing. Um, as some practical ways of dealing with healing, they passed a gun law. When she said that, I thought, ha, 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 lady. <laughs> Thinking of the U.S., well, they did it, honestly, one vote against in a matter of days. Um, people gave money so that uh, the victims could be buried in the way that is consistent with Muslim uh, tradition. Um, because it was just, as you can imagine, in a very small place, that many people dying is just horrendous. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I brought back the cold from there, which I always do. But um, People just rallied. I mean, there were vigils all over. There were flowers all over. It was quite an absolutely amazing thing. And the Muslim population is small. New Zealand is a very small country. It's only a wee bit bigger than Oregon. And the population is only a bit bigger than Oregon. So, you know, people know each other who know each other, maybe. Um, so that's probably part of it. But the effort of reaching out, people went and stood outside the mosques um, so people could go in and pray. I'm sorry. <laughs> It was very emotional. Um, and I know people are doing that here also, sometimes. Uh, and I think that it's that outreach, it's that sense of we are all one that makes it possible for healing to happen. Instead of, I'm better than you are, I'm not you. I have a better religion, I have no religion, so I'm better, I, you know, whatever. The culture in... Uh, New Zealand seems to me to be much more humble, much more authentic. Um, people are not judged so much on status. You know, do you have a PhD? Well, okay, well, you're wonderful. <laughs> are you a crass person? Oh, well, you're not so good. I mean, it's much more of an authentically communal place, which I think makes a huge difference. Um, more connected to nature, uh, my grandson learns in preschool a little song, and I will not <laughs> sing it for you. I will say it for He learns it in Maori and in English, but um, I can't pronounce the Maori. But it is, uh, let me get the words right. Dunedin, Dunedin, which is the city he lives in, and then the River Leith, which is the river that goes through that, my mountain is Mount Cargo, which is the mountain close to there. And then Otago, Otago, which is the region. And that's the way the children are taught their heritage and identity. 
And I was thinking, you know, what if we did that? If we were taught our children and ourselves, we are people of Mount Hood and the Willamette River, instead of all these divisions that we have. Um, so I guess the thing I just wanted to say was, to me, watching it all was a sense that uh, there was a sense of unity, that we really are all one. And people are also starting to say, we need to look at ourselves. Are there kinds of prejudice and discrimination in our culture that we need to think about? Because it was a horrible loss of innocence. This country had never, ever experienced this. And they thought somehow they're so little and so far away <laughs> that maybe they would not have to experience something so horrendous, but they did. And I think those things, you know, being humble, being authentic, being willing to look at themselves and really reach out on an equal level to people saying, you know, we're part of this. If you're hurting, we're hurting. So that's just what I want to leave to you in terms of my observations and experience. And also to say, today we had at Cedar Hills a meeting of our racial justice and equity team. And we we're wanting to do some kind of a program for Welcome Beaverton in the fall, welcoming all people, immigrants, refugees, whoever. Uh, and wondering if any of you in your groups or communities would like to join in that. So we do it together and not just any one of us. So if you think you would, um, let, you can let Mustafa know he's got my information. And uh, thank you so much for letting me be here today. And if you have those pictures, you can have them. Thank you so much, Peg, uh, for your support, that the support that we have been giving, uh, getting for the last two decades. Uh, so we simply cannot thank you enough. Uh, next, we will have Rabbi Joey Wolf and Rabbi Rose, if you can come in and uh, speak for a few minutes, please. <laughs> thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Um, I want to say first and foremost, it's a uh, it's an awesome kind of privilege to be here with you today. Um, I'm mindful of that, and uh, to live up to that privilege and the honor of standing here together with you at at Bilal Mosque uh, to be with my friend Shariar again and to be with Mustafa. Um, I, I thought about, well, maybe it had something to do with the fact that this week on the Jewish calendar and Jewish rhythm, we, we go into a holiday that I think helps me to investigate what does it mean to be living in times like this. That's Passover. Because when it comes to Passover, what do Jews do? We tell a story. We figure out how to tell a story about where we are. Okay? And many folks think mistakenly, I believe, that the story of Passover is, is getting out of oppression, coming forth from a narrow place, out of slavery. But that's not where the story begins. And in fact, um, there is a statement in the Haggadah, the, the, the pamphlet, or the book, or the order that we go through when we tell the story, it begins like this, it says, Baruch Shomer Haftachatol Israel. It says, blessed be the one, blessed is God, who keeps his promise. And what's the promise? Promises that there's good news and there's bad news. And it's delivered to Abraham. Okay? The good news we know, we get out of a bad situation. But first and foremost, we find out that we're going to spend 400 years in darkness in a bad place. And I've always thought to myself, what does this mean? What kind of promise is this? I mean, uh, why wouldn't it have been enough to go free? And I've come to realize that the real issue is, how is it that all of us, any of us, end up in a situation like the one we've found ourselves in? in Christchurch, in Pittsburgh, 
many years ago, but not so many years ago, where Japanese Americans were interned on the southern Texas border in California, where Latinas and Latinos are routinely separated from their children, where we built walls at all times to keep people apart, tear them apart, and create pain, more pain, more suffering. Why do we have to become strangers first? Because according to the story, for 400 years, you'll be a stranger in a strange land. I don't have the answer to that question. I ask a lot of questions, but I did read something recently which piqued my interest. It made me think a lot. There was a writer, you may have read him. There was an op-ed in the New York Times. A writer whose name is Boris, Boris Fishman. And he is someone who's, at this point, a writer of fiction in this country, but he, he hails from the city of Minsk in Belarus. He's a Russian Jew. And he said that growing up, he was always protected by his parents. He was coddled. So he never realized that he was the odd guy out, the other. And he, was, uh, he felt safe. However, when he came to this country, the irony was, and I'm talking about coming to America, he says that his cushy childhood came to a close because it was when he got to this country that his parents no longer had the resources or the standing to take care of him, to protect him. Now, irony of irony, here we are 30 years later, and he has a child of his own. And apparently she has a very fair complexion. She's as white as could be. And the writer says, you know, I'm worried that we miss something. So something's going to be tough for this kid. This kid is not going to know what exile is. And if you read on, he says, he says that exile is the shorthand route to empathy. It's the shorthand route to empathy. So I begin to understand that there's no honest to God freedom that any of us have, wherever we are, without the experience of learning from others, of understanding estrangement, and of working at empathy, and recognizing and honoring difference, and being hospitable, something that we should learn from our traditions. That's where freedom really begins. So how should we remember the precious ones whose lives were given up as they bowed to pray in New Zealand, our brothers and our sisters? How might we effectively memorialize their lives, their good works, their kindness, by opening our hearts and recognizing that we're all strangers, even the ones who don't think that they're strangers. And we should recall that the world will be a better place where people see that freedom is something gained by virtue of hospitality and humility and an open heart. And in Jewish terms, we say, Bezoar harakia mazirim. May their memories, the memories of the innocent ones, sparkle in the firmament and light a path for all of us. Amen. I'll give you some advice. If you ever have to speak in public, make sure you're not speaking after Rabbi Joey. <laughs> and I'll also say, I don't have much to add, but I'm also a rabbi, so I'm going to talk. <laughs> um, uh, so I, I, want, I just want to say that um, I, I want to sh I'm going to share with you a passage from the Haggadah, from, the, from the, the story that we read on Pesach, on Passover, which is just coming up on this, on this Friday night. But I want to uh, I want to first um, tell you that I want to do a little text test here because we're among a religious crowd. So 
I'm reading this, this story about God bringing this people out of Egypt because he wants to make sure that they're okay. What, what book is this? It's in the Quran. So it is in Exodus. It is in Exodus. But it's also in the Quran. The Quran tells us also that, um, that God is aware of, of B'nai Yisrael um, suffering in Egypt and that God wants to take them out. So those who know, those who know texts of any kind, as, as Meg said, and um, those who, who know Quran and Torah, we know that there's, that there's one God. And I don't know if Islam has such a, uh, such a tradition, but in the Jewish tradition there are midrashim, there are stories that tell us that, that God weeps that God weeps, and so that we know, um, we know in, in that day in, in New Zealand, we know that God wept, and that pain that we felt when all of us uh, heard that horrific, horrific news, that, that feeling was the feeling uh, of God weeping. And so I, I want you to know um, that, uh, the, that the Jewish people um, wept with you and, and continued to, to weep over the sorrow of those families and those, and those lost souls. So Rabbi Joey uh, talked about empathy, which is what I was going to talk about. Thank you very much. <laughs> we talked about empathy, and I, I think that so much hinges on this. Uh, so Passover, which starts Friday night, is uh, among the most important days, or it's really an eight-day festival, in the Jewish calendar. Um, and it actually serves as a kind of Jewish New Year. It's one of the Jewish New Years, you could say. And I think that the reason for its importance is because of its focus on empathy. And the, the Haggadah, the, the, the story that we read during Passover, says, excuse me, In every generation, each person is obligated to, to see themselves, to perceive themselves as if they themselves came out of Egypt. And I think that the reason for this is that, as that story that you, that article you discussed, um, says so powerfully, um, the capacity to have empathy, the our ability to whether we're reading the Quran or reading the story in Exodus, to m make our hearts one with those who suffered in Egypt. So much rides on that capacity. We we live in a, in a time of increasing coarseness. Um, when uh, somehow people roll their eyes at the idea of empathy and compassion as, this, as if these were things to be embarrassed about rather than the greatest uh, gift that God gave human beings. So that empathy has to extend not only to, uh, to each of our own people and each of our own past, but as we know, to all human beings because all of us are created the Tzalab Elohim, as the Hebrew, uh, as, as the Torah tells us, in the image of God, and that's why God weeps, and so we, we stand with you. And I want to just read something to you that um, is really is in the very beginning of the Haggadah, in the very beginning. So when we all sit down Friday night to begin our Passover uh, uh, journey, um, we will get rid of some of the preliminaries, and then when the real core part of it starts, um, we read a paragraph, which I'll, I'll chant in a minute, um, and I want us to imagine its meaning in the broadest possible sense, because on, on, uh, on Friday night, um, I will be thinking of, of, of all of you, um, of, my, of my Muslim cousins and brothers and sisters, and of the nishamas, the souls of those who perished in New Zealand. So we hold up the matzah, the, the unleavened bread, and we say, if I can find it, this is, a, this is the poor person's bread. This is the bread that our ancestors ate in the land of Egypt. Um, all those who are hungry, let them enter and eat. All who are in need, let them come celebrate the Passover. Now we are here, next year, in the land of Israel together. This year we are enslaved. Next, uh, next year may, may all of us be together and be free. So we pray that, uh, that right now all of us are hungry and brokenhearted. And we pray next year may we all be together. May we all be one. And I'll just close by chanting it. If I can, well, now Wikipedia is being all goofy. I'm going to go ahead and guess that nobody here has the text of Halach Ma'anya on that. Um, and I don't know well enough. Oh, here it is. Okay. <clears throat> 
If I get emotional, it's maybe because of this moment, but it's also because I always hear my father's voice uh, whenever, uh, whenever I chant this. So, Halach ma'anya diachlu avatna va'arat de mitzrayim kodich bin yetevecho kodich rich yetevisach hashtahachaha l'shana haba'a ba'aradi suite Yisrael hashtah avade avade l'shana haba'a b'nei chorin may it be so. Thank you, Rabbi Joey Wolf, and thank you, Rabbi Rose. Uh, what a, uh, wonderful words. Uh, as Rabbi Rose, I was listening to you, you were saying that God weeps. Uh, I'm sure Sharia or Al Muhammad Dean probably can give a better explanation. The thing that I know of in Quran, we have something similar, is that if a, a, a grave injustice is done to the humanity, the seventh heaven, uh, where we believe that God and angels are, the whole thing shakes, uh, which is in a poster, we can say that God weeps. No, I mean, if, so you got the idea. Okay, so uh, the next set of speakers, I would like to uh, welcome uh, Alan Worley, please, if you can come on in and share some few words, please. I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to uh, share some thoughts with you. Um, as we have reflected on the injustice that took place, the horrific a tragedy that took place in New Zealand and recognize those who um, are suffering even today. Um, I'm, I'm led to, um, to have read an article which I think I will share part of it with you that I think um, is counterintuitive to what has happened, but I think speaks a lot of truth. Let me share with you. All that is, God, that is of God encompasses love, light, and truth. Yet as human beings, we live in a fallen world, sometimes full of darkness and confusion. And it comes at no surprise that mistakes will be made, injustices will occur, and tragedies will be committed. As a result, there is not a soul alive who will not at one time or another be the victim of someone else's careless, hurtful conduct or even sinful behavior. That is one thing that we all have in common. Gratefully, God in his love and mercy for his children has prepared a way to help us navigate these sometimes turbulent experiences of life. He has provided an escape for all who fall victim to the misdeeds of others. He has taught us that we can forgive. Even though we may be a victim once, we need not be a victim twice by carrying the burden of hate, bitterness, pain, resentment or even revenge. We can forgive, we can be free. When we have experienced an injustice, we may be quick to say, that person did wrong, they deserve punishment. Where is the justice? We mistakenly think that if we forgive, somehow justice will not be served and punishment will be avoided. This is simply not the case. God will met out a punishment that is fair, for mercy cannot rob justice. God lovingly assures you and me, leave judgment alone with me, for it is mine and I will repay. But let peace be with you. As victims, <clears throat> We are faith, as victims, if we are faithful, we can take great comfort in knowing that God will compensate for us for every injustice we experience. I just share that with you because I know that now uh, the natural process for us is to feel anger, the hate, resentment. 
but that is God's to address. For us, now comes the process of learning how to forgive. I share that with you in God's name. Thank you, Alan. Uh, next, I would like to uh, invite Pastor Beth and followed by Sharia. I know he's somewhere here. Yes, and we'll follow up with uh, Pat. You know, there's a special segment for him. Okay. I am uh, Beth Brashear. I'm the pastor at St. Luke Lutheran Church. And I've only been here in the Portland area for almost two years. But I am so grateful for Bilal Mosque, uh, who's had a, a relationship with, with my worshiping community for many years beyond that. And I came here first because our middle schoolers came here and shared in a service project with the youth from Bilal. And I absolutely laud and am grateful for the willingness and openness of the Bilal community to reach out and to continue to invite people in, which at times, especially at times when our world is so polarized, it would be easier to shut the doors and keep others out, but you welcome people in, and that's beautiful. That to me is of God. And um, as it is with our, our Jewish brothers and sisters in the, the Christian faith, of course, this too is a big week for us. This is Holy Week. And uh, this is the week where, where Christians lift up that uh, God chose to show us once and for all that the forces of hatred and evil, the forces of fear, do not have the last word. But love, love gives life. And love ultimately has that last word. Not just a love of feeling warm and fuzzy, but a love that is active. And um, this week, one of the, the lessons that we will be hearing in, in Lutheran churches around the country is about how, how Jesus chose to take on a servant role and wash the feet of his disciples, people who were considered beneath him. This is the same Jesus who, by the way, every time somebody said, we are the in crowd, we are God's chosen people, Jesus would draw the circle bigger and would say, oh, are you so sure that we can exclude others and say that they are not of God? And this is a Jesus who um, will celebrate on Thursday night how he stooped to practice love by serving others. And that love I have seen modeled here at Bilal. And I am, I hope I'm not spoiling this for you, but um, the call to action later on. Um, but through some of the young people here at Bilal who are looking at how can we work together with people, young people of all faiths, to serve that is a touchable form of the love of God. And I believe, my faith tradition believes with me, that this sort of love has the power to transform this world. Maybe in just small pockets and moments at a time, but it does have that power. And I thank you for the opportunity for us to, to work together to practice that love. And so I um, would like, then this is a very Lutheran thing, so please humor me. Lutherans like to sing. <laughs> and we also have a famous line that says, he who sings prays twice. So there is a song that I'm going to draw from a, a broader tradition, from an ecumenical tradition from the Tizé community, a French community that welcomed people from all over Europe after World War II into a place of safety. And one of the songs that they sing is called Ubi Caritas, which means 
Where true charity and love abide, God is dwelling there. And we'll do it in English. And I invite you to do it with me. But I'm going to say the words, then I'm going to sing it, and then I'm going to invite you to join in. We'll sing it through a few times so that if you don't know it at first, you'll know it by the time we're done. <laughs> so and the words go like this. Where true charity and love abide, God is dwelling there. God is dwelling there. Where true charity and love abide, God is dwelling there. God is dwelling there. Join me. Where true charity So much for your support. We really appreciate this. Um, so now I would like to welcome Salmanti. I know you're somewhere here. Salmanti, if you can come up for a few minutes, please. And Sharika will follow. She's known also the mother of the community, by the way. This is spring. Last night I was at MET, as you know, 300 plus people against interfaith, and they talk about and touch on what happened in New Zealand. Amazing the country. The mayor of New Zealand, within six weeks of the tragedy, they were able to pass the law, and it's just in the house for a bill about gun control. Another six weeks, the law against the automatic will be again in the house. For me, this is amazing how fast is it, how fast it is that in a matter of short time, the whole country of New Zealand was able to do this it's only because of the tragedy. The action of, I was in New Zealand for about five weeks. The most beautiful people in America, in the world, are in New Zealand. From north to south, we traveled by car. There are more ships though than people. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. And you can always get the first lamb, but by 11 o'clock you go, it's gone, and that's it this ladder at six o'clock. So what I'm saying is that a country like New Zealand that is so peaceful and this thing happened. Last Tuesday, I was in a four hour workshop with the FBI and the topic was how can we protect ourselves after Columbine and Sandy? How can we, and it was a four hour workshop because they teach you how you can 
react at that moment and not to think that it cannot happen to us or to, to where we are. It can happen anywhere, anytime. So the stress about three things, run, hide, and fight. I had a question. Suppose you were attacked while you are praying. Suppose the attacker is in the back. How can you do that? There's no, there's no way. So I guess our fate is the one that has to protect us. Jewism came. Prophet Moses was sent here by God to repair the world. Christianity came. Jesus has preached love, which was that, and charity. Islam came. And Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace be upon him, and peace be all the prophets, Islam has emphasized on compassion and mercy. At the end of the day, the bottom line is all the three people of the book, the Abrahamic fate, is to be a good human being, help each other, love each other, be kind to each other, and at the end of the day, there's compassion and mercy on all of us. So what has happened in New Zealand is another wake up call to all of us. It's another way that God again reminds us that we have to be united. And we have to help each other to repair what is undone, to love one another, have compassion and mercy on each other. Once again, thank you for coming today at Bilal. I just got back two days ago from LA and Mustafa just called me, so I'm not really, but just so happy to everybody. So happy. And Miriam, I just met you three, two days ago or last night, and we mentioned, and here she is. She is from, uh, it was, I was in the city, the uh, Jewish celebration and reenactment re of how the Jewish people from slavery, how they were saved on their flight to Israel. Again, it was from God, the message to Moses, that he has to pre free his people from slavery. Miriam, are you there? I hope I'm saying the right thing, but that ceremony, it was two and a half hours, it was Amazing. Thank you for coming. Last minute thing and she showed up. Thank you so much. One more time. Thank you and I see Pat Gary. Pat, thank you for coming. Thank you again. Thank you so much. With that, we'll finish it all with uh, Shari Irvani, who is the president of our mosque. And I'm sure you have heard him speak. Actually, let me see. Like, How many of you guys have uh, heard him speak, by the way? Pretty much everyone. It's difficult, as you know, to follow Sister Salama. We, we gave her no time, but mashallah, she's brought things together so well. And it's even more difficult to speak after Rabbi uh, Joey and uh, Rabbi Rose. But um, I'll, give it, I'll give it a shot. And uh, maybe I will, I may break the kumbaya moment that we are going through a little bit. I've been, I've been struggling of what to say, but we'll say inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. إن الحمد لله إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونتوب إليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يحيي الله فلا مدل له ومن يدلل فلا هادي له وأشهد والله إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري احل العقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي اما بعد in synopsis what i just said is a preamble that the prophet muhammad would use in most of his um, speeches and when i had recited it at um, shari tora uh, when we first met the rabbi stopped me in the midst and he said i can't believe this as you are quoting i had it i had the meaning uh, written out as you were quoting my head is flying through the Torah from the verses that are related there. So in, in synopsis, this is what I said. 
all praises are due to are owed to god i praise him i seek his mercy i seek his guidance i seek his protection especially for the evil or the bad that is in me i remember all the prophets i remember especially prophet muhammad and i seek mercy on for himself and his uh, offsprings uh, as he has shown the same mercy to abraham and his offsprings i recited the prayer of moses who when he went in front of the pharaoh asked god to untie his his tongue and to fill his chest with strength and confidence to speak and as i do today i I'm, i'm still trying in my head which way to go so I will rely on God, Allah, and then we shall we shall proceed. It has been a very interesting week, though. Would you pause to think why? We had the first picture of the black hole. The very first picture of the black hole. So typically, I don't write things down, but in this case, I think I had to because I really wanted you to. I wanted to be instrumental in trying to have you appreciate what humanity did. This black hole is in the center of a galaxy, Messier 87, which is 55 million light years away. It takes half a light day for light to traverse our solar system. it takes light half a day to go from one end of our solar system to the other this galaxy is 55 million light years away it is 6.5 billion times heavier than our sun it is a thousand times larger than the black hole that is the center of the milky way itself it is equivalent what what humanity just did is equivalent of seeing a penny from the earth on the surface of the moon distinctly with the feature and with the words one penny <laughs> from the earth on the surface of the moon it took 200 astronomers radio astronomers the planning took about 7 years it required 8 observatories in four continents each of the instrument in each of the observatories had to be perfectly synchronized and each were tethered to the other through atomic to their own individual atomic clocks it took it needed 10 days of clear weather in all of the locations in the four continents the formal search when all the equipment was in place and all the math was in place when all the computational capabilities were in place took more than 7 years it took they were ready and the search started in the in april of 2017 the search ended on april 10th of this year it created Five petabytes of data. I didn't even know what a petabyte was. <laughs> It's one to the ten to the power fifteen bytes. It took half a ton of hard drives to collect the data. <laughs> you typically have two pounds. You have at least two of these huge hard drives in each of your laptops, which you walk around with your fingertips. It took five half a ton of hard drives. <clears throat> and this data was moved to US and, Ger- and in Germany the data was analyzed in the Haystack Observatory at MIT and at the Max Planck Institute of Radio Observatory it was a culmination of pure theory of looking at the stars appreciating what is going on and thinking looking observing and thinking and saying this may be happening that thinking started with einstein was rattled by um S- stephen hawkins einstein never believed in a black hole 
In the center of a black hole, mass is supposed to be infinite, is supposed to be zero, and the force of gravity is supposed to be infinite. And Einstein said that it is not natural for to have this kind of disruption in nature. It's pure theory. It is observation. It is seeing something every day, every night in the skies. Why is this happening? Why is that light flickering? It's observing what is in front of you and coming up with an understanding, creating data that was crunched. And you can look it up. And when the data was analyzed, and poof, the image came. So the data does not say, show me the image. The data is a series of mathematical equations that's crunching. And at the end of the day, these eight observatories who have been collecting data for 10 days in perfectly synchronized instruments, they don't know what's going to pop out. One mistake and it can fall. And what they saw was exactly at a high level what it predicted. A black hole with um, the event horizon. Do you guys know what the event horizon is? The event horizon is the edge of the black hole at which all human understanding fails. Everything fails. No one knows what laws exist inside the black hole. Me and my, we, I have a friend who goes, he's a young kid, and we were exchanging notes. And I had told him that all the laws fail, and he replies back except one. The picture comes, and it is a picture of a black hole. It amazes me that a people, that a nation, that a world with such acute power of observation, with such acute power of bringing together what people have known and thought and seen in history and presenting in such a magnificent form, in spite of all of that, in spite of all of that, In spite of the nine who died in the Mother Emanuel Church in Charleston, South Carolina, the 12 who perished in the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, my daughter used to live there. She would walk across Squirrel Hill. One night she calls me, 9 o'clock our time, 12 o'clock their time, cursing the buses that didn't come. And I said, where are you? I'm passing by the synagogue. Why? Because this area is safer. And it's raining, and it's cold. The nine who died in the Mother Emanuel Church, South Carolina, 12 who perished in the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, and the 50 who perished in Christchurch, New Zealand. There is this unfathomable, terrifying, institutionalized silence in spite of these events. Yes, we are having a wonderful Kumbaya event. We are talking about peace, we are talking about love, we are talking about empowering our children, but there is an institutionalized silence, especially in the US of A. And we can let that silence prolong itself and we know historically what this does. This black hole is a culmination of observation, of understanding what data tells me, of understanding if the equations are right. I will see a hole in the middle and a spinning disk outside where the intensity is so high that it will send me, it will manifest itself as light. We know when things like this happen, what history has told us, and yet there is an institutional silence. And I use the word institutionalized because there is still hope. The hope was there in South Carolina when the community came together. The hope was there in Pittsburgh when the community came together. When Muslims and Jews hugged each other, which was thought to be impossible. <laughs> for reasons that you know. And you are here. And New Zealand. Ah, New Zealand. 
the Prime Minister with her wonderful accent. The way the institution, I'm using my words very carefully, the way the institution responded and the nation changed. So, I will conclude in the words of Imam Fauda of the Al Nur Mosque, who saw 50 of his congregants perish. He told New Zealand, we are broken hearted, but not broken. He thanked New Zealanders for their tears, your flowers, your love, and your compassion. And I myself, personally, as a father, as a husband, as a reasonably practicing Muslim, and as a strong American, would like to thank you all, not only for New Zealand. You have stood by us since 9-11. You have helped us grow. You have helped us be real Americans. It is when we went to make this mosque and went to Washington County, that is when we really started putting down notes, roots. And that is where I met Pat Garrett for the first time. Who would work with a policeman, man? Come on, give me a break. <laughs> I can go on and on. Joey, we had this wonderful event at Havura. Abraham, one father, two sons. Do you remember? So, God willing, we'll get through. But the question all of you need to ask as you leave and you go back to your workplaces, to your places of worship, to your events, at what price? At what price? And will you continue to be part of this institutionalized silence? No. Or will you take it and God willing, be the instruments that God wants us to be? Once again, I hope I did not depress you too much. <laughs> this is a great nation. The greatness that we have is an institution. And for all of you, I would recommend a book, McCullough's John Adams. Read it. I wish I had a little bit more time. I could have quoted from John Adams as, as what he wrote to Abigail Adams. So thank you. Very, thank you very much. And God willing, inshallah, we'll get through. And for all of you guys, thank you very much for cradling us with your love and giving us the strength for ourselves and especially for our children for them to get through whatever comes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sharif. It was, as usual, an amazing speech. Uh, now I would like to welcome a special person who has been with our uh, community, uh, taking things all the time, good times and bad times. Uh, he is our uh, Washington County Sheriff, Pat Garrett. Pat, would you like to come in and say a few words, please? Thank you, Mustafa. I am amazingly humbled to be among the wise men and women of faith who are speaking today. And the thoughts that I have, uh, in, a, in a long, dark shadow cast by the New Zealand massacre and the, the mass murders that have been that have been discussed here today, <clears throat> there 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 are beacons of light, and the Bilal Mosque the great big wonderful community tied to this place and our relationship with the Muslim community is one such such beacon. We, uh, as Shavir re referenced, I think it was September 12th of 2001 when we met and we have learned so much uh, from, from this place and our Muslim brothers and sisters and it was the, going back a little less than a month ago, it was the morning after, the morning after the New Zealand massacre and I was preparing to teach that morning, and uh, at the same time, I was trying to catch up on the events of the previous day online. And I got a phone call from a patrol sergeant. And the patrol sergeant said, hey, Sheriff, this is uh, Sergeant Martin. I just want you to know I'm, uh, I'm at the Bilal. And it was 7-ish, it was 7-ish, 7.30. I'm in the parking lot. Um, it just seemed like the right thing to do. We talked about it in briefing, and we got a plan to 
you know, hang out here today, up our, up our visibility. We got to go to calls, so we can't be here all the time, but they made a plan, and, and, and the deputies have worked in Aloha, and nobody had to tell them to do that, because they feel a responsibility to this place. <laughs> and in my discussion with um, our Tigard Police Department partners, who the Muslim Educational Trust is in the city of Tigard, the very same thing happened. <clears throat> They just, they just showed up. They didn't know what to do. Uh, Sarah Martin asked me when Friday prayers were going to take place that day so that we could do the very best we could to be here. So we're going to do everything we can uh, to keep uh, our brothers and sisters safe, safe here. And I just want to commend the courage that Sharir, Mustafa, Salma, everybody in the entire Bilal Mosque community has to open up uh, this place and to build relationships and help us. Yeah, you know, whether we have been wonderful uh, uh, and interested in learning, uh, but even if we weren't, sure it would drag us kicking and screaming until we <laughs> could understand. So I appreciate their tenacity and their courage to open this place up. It's, it's uh, a really key part of what makes uh, this community special. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I know we are running a little bit behind, so we'll try to catch up. So as you're listening to different faith leaders today, uh, I'm sure there is a burning question in your mind, is that, uh, is there a call to action? That yes, you know, we have been hearing like, you know, love, sympathy, uh, empathy, emotions. So the question is, what are we doing? Uh, what are we going to do? Is there a call to action? So don't despair. Uh, so the, the youth from different congregations actually have been meeting together for quite some time. Uh, and actually they're working on something. So I don't want to uh, sell, uh, spill out the, all the details. I would like to invite one of the uh, youth participants. So you so people can come in and tell us what's going on from the youth side. In case you couldn't tell, that was my dad. So that was very awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Yusuf, and I'm an eighth grader that goes here to Bilal. I'm 13 year old, uh, and you're probably thinking that that's just one of those kids, that's 13 year olds, who wastes his time on his phone all the time. Oh, I, I hope I'm not, but <laughs> I would like to tell you guys about something that the youth and youth from Bilal have been doing recently in order to try to bring our community together. If you have a dad like my dad, it's not possible for you not to hear about something as horrible as New Zealand. So I heard immediately about what had happened and I was obviously devastated because usually I had thought of New Zealand and Australia as a pretty safe place and I have no doubt that they are safe, completely safe, but it just kind of shook me inside. So that week at Sunday school, my teacher Ozim Uncle, he had a discussion with us about what to do and how to respond to people who had questions about that. And we had a discussion and it was kind of hard for everyone to get through because it's not every day that you have to wake up to hear some horrible news like that. But we came to the conclusion that the reason, the main reason this had happened was due to a massive misunderstanding within different people. And personally, I think the only way to overcome misunderstandings is to try to build the community together and make sure that everyone understands everything about everyone else. It doesn't have to be like, oh, I, Joey's going to go get his car washed tomorrow at 9 o'clock. <laughs> but it should be as simple as, yes, this person has this belief, and that's fine. So we got together with some youth. We first of all met Pastor Beth's youth, and we had a great discussion with them about different ways we can unite our community. And since we live in Oregon, it's, it's kind of natural to say that we want to do something environmentally related. And that's what we decided on because almost everyone here knows that our environment is very important and Oregon is one of the greener states in the country, so that would just make a great choice. So we've been talking for a few months now about different actions we can take and we've agreed that we want to do something that people can realize that, yes, some of the youth don't really understand what's happening and they probably won't understand what's happening for a long time, but the best we can do is try to inform people and tell them that this is a problem, but there's other ways we can get over that. So we've decided that we're going to do a park cleanup at Tryon Creek State Park on May 5th. And that's not directly going to solve problems like massacres and stuff like that, but we want to build up to the point where we can have those discussions about 
things that happen around the world. So like I said, we've been meeting for some time and we've narrowed down to the park cleanup and another project to help kids at Dornbecker <coughs> and raise uh, supplies for them so that they can have a great stay there. And I feel it's very important for youth to get involved with this because this is happening today and it will probably continue to happen for many, many more years before things like this begin to stop happening. So if any of you guys would like to send some of your youth towards us, we would be more than happy to incorporate them in our project because the more people we can get on this, the better. And if we can do more projects and unite the community that way, that's just absolutely great, I feel. So in conclusion, I hope you realize that things like this are going to keep happening. And the way to solve that is we need to do something as a community to prevent this. And adults can do some things, but I feel like it's also important for the youth to be able to get engaged in our own communities. And if you have any questions, I should be in the back somewhere, otherwise I'll probably be outside. <laughs> and you can come ask me questions. And thank you so much for your time and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. So we are getting almost to the end. I know we have blown past our timeline. Uh, so let's open up for a quick Q&A uh, for a few minutes. If you have any questions or anything, uh, we will try our best to answer that. I have a very practical question for you. So how, what grade are the kids who are involved? Uh, we're looking for specifically middle and high schoolers. Middle and high school. Okay, thanks. That was an easy one. <laughs> yes, Peg. I think what the youth are doing is wonderful. And I think adults ought to be doing stuff also. Instead of just oh, absolutely. Playing with absolutely. Kids. Um, and it just occurred to me, I'm wondering, you know, there used to be dialogues between Jewish Christian congregations back in the Midwest when I was there. Um, would there be any possibility of doing multiple religious community dialogues? Absolutely. Where people just get together in small groups, really get to know each other. You know, it's one way, it's not going to solve. A terrorist, a domestic terrorist, of course, but it's one way of getting getting to know one another more. Absolutely. I, I think there used to be several events like you know, dad's night out, mom's night out. Uh, we used to have things like that, but what as hap what happens is that you know, we get more or more busy. I'm not necessarily yeah. saying that this is an excuse. Uh, we so we started things like that, but. Unfortunately, I would say that we ran out of bandwidth, but yes, you know, we would love to do that more, and I'm sure everyone would be interested in doing that. Well, so, I don't think it should just have to be well that way. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think you guys do a great job. So, so what we're looking for is, you know, if someone is really dedicated and passionate about this, uh, let's pony up and we'll figure something. We'll figure something. We can use your mailing list to start the discussion. You're absolutely, absolutely. Discussion. Great feedback, Peg. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Are you going to answer, or uh, Zimhai, do you want to answer? I think, uh, let him answer, he's good at this. I honestly think, I honestly think you guys already are. In other words, I can't tell you, okay, attend more meetings. Whenever we have had anything, you've been there. As Pat said, we didn't have to call. The officers were already there. The thing is to engage with those who are not here. That's where the problem is. It's the institutionalized silence. I see it at work. I see it everywhere. And everyone thinks it's going to disappear. So that's where I think, and the thing to ask yourself is, are you doing this for us? Or are you doing it for yourself? Are you doing it for us? Or are you doing it for US of A? So if you focus and believe that you're doing it for the US of A, things will be different. Right. Advice that we give is if you hear something, listen something, call the police. We have told our kids, I said it in the, in the Friday sermon. If you're threatened, don't be a hero and start getting into an idiotic fight. Pat has said, call 911. Oh, if they get over, call 911, they'll get upset at us once in a while, but it's still safer to do that. And if things happen, document them. 
He needs data. The FBI needs data. And without data, there can't be follow-up at his end to be preemptive. The only way you can be preemptive is if you know where the channels are. I mean, you should have gotten a lot of practice by just figuring out the Muslim terrorists for 90, 11 years. You know, yet you need those are the type of um, institutions that you need. So, listen, talk, engage with the police, uh, engage with law enforcement, and you're already with us, and, and, and that's, that's basically what you're doing. The two questions, one she's asking, and then she, she is asking one and question. And to follow up on your gracious comment that we are already doing it, do we not elect you, sir? We, so this is the sheriff of Washington County. We elect him. Uh, I vote for him. And we've elected a fine person who's made sure that we have law enforcement that already is Absolutely. doing the right thing. So yay for us. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> There's a question yeah, yeah, she has a question. The, the microphone. Yes, thank you um, very much uh, for inviting us. Um, I, I wanted to know, um, I think I've seen the sheriff before at a cultural festival, the first annual Muslim cultural festival. Um, yes, okay, get to my question. Are, are there continuing to be uh, Muslim cultural festivals? Um, if not, can we start having them again so people can s start to uh, interact on yeah. an interface? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so I, I can uh, answer. Uh, so there are several events that actually uh, happening are planning to take. One is a cultural event that takes place. MET sponsors something, and we are also planning to have a, some sort of a like uh, lecture series throughout the whole year where we have picked different topics. Uh, and uh, have some sort of a, uh, I would say, lecture discussion sessions. For example, like you know, one of the topics that you know we are brought up to is like you know, uh, Islam in the West. Uh, is there a, a conflict between Islam and West? Uh, Islam and women. Uh, Islam and jihad. These are the topics that people have come, you know, uh, talked to, you know, said that hey guys, you know, we'd like to have some sort of a conversation. So yes, we are planning to have some sort of discussions uh, during the Ramadan time. There will be some events. Uh, in fact, actually, that's a, you, you actually give me a good reminder that Ramadan is coming up probably in a month or so. Uh, you probably know that last year we did a, some sort of a, like you know Ramadan iftar session. We are planning to do something similar also. Uh, this will be taking place on May 27th. That's a Monday, but that's a holiday. Okay, uh, that's a so please uh, we will send the invite. So uh, we urge you to RSVP so that we can arrange the food. So yes, things are taking place and will continue to take place. So. There is one thing I keep telling our, our, us Muslims is that I think we have this Muslims that, oh, we're going to do a grand big one. We don't need grand big events. We need every mosque that's out there to engage and do something. And we are struggling. We are struggling. So if you think about what can we do, we can do a lot. Every mosque, reaching out to the neighbors and having a discussion, right? whatever it is at whatever level. And then you have given us good ideas about events and cultural events, stars, and uh, small small dialogues um, with, between the groups. And I don't know if uh, Brother Mustafa told them, but I think I said the laptop over there for people to sign up. Yes, that's correct. You know, if you are not in our mailing list, we appreciate if you can uh, sign up your name, please. You can donate too. <laughs> <laughs> We're not asking for donations today. <laughs> in this room, you will see. The there are brave and loving people, but for Loki Loos and for people who are not brave and who want to just Loki Loo, like in the public park, um, the cultural festival, I think are really important first steps yep. for people who take baby steps and do, oh, those are real life Muslims. They're really nice people. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. That's a good idea. So let's take one more question, then we'll, then we'll try to wrap it up. Yes. Uh, my husband and I rent rooms to international students, and over the last, I don't know, 11 years, I've probably posted uh, maybe 30 or more uh, Muslims in my home. Oh, most, wow. Mostly Saudi. And um, they... I, I am an evangelical Christian, 
I have grew up, I mean, I've spent most of my adult life attending Beaverton Foursquare. And um, I think, you know, besides the bigger events, uh, little things, I, it might seem a little weird, but I've gone now, so where I'm, when I'm out in public, if I see a woman in a hijab, I will make a point to say, Salam Alaikum. Thank you. And, um, oh, they look, sometimes they might feel a little tense, you know, and then they see me and just give them that big smile. And then other people, then they will smile back, and then other people around you will see you smiling at each other, and I might start a conversation with them, and then this is so ridiculous, but then other people hear, oh, they're just normal people. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So we are actually...